Hello Year 12s and welcome to English Language at Bullerswood School. The purpose of this PowerPoint really is in lieu of the induction day that you would have had had COVID-19 not scuppered all our plans. But I hope it gives you some sort of flavour of what we're going to be doing in English language. I hope it interests you um, and I hope it makes you want to follow through and join us at um, Bullerswood English Language. Um, and hopefully that you'll stay with us right to the end of year 13 and not only get some great academic success out of this course, but also get a feel for what happens in the real world and how language shapes just the very people that we are. I think you've made a wise choice. So I'm going to start off really just by talking you through a few very, very basic things, basic housekeeping, as I call it. This in front of you is the course textbook. I would like every single one of my students to get this textbook. It is expensive, but it does carry you through the whole two years and it is invaluable. I don't teach from it, but it is an invaluable tool for you for doing your homeworks, for doing your research, for doing your independent study. Now, I am very aware of how expensive textbooks are. Um, I was a single parent myself. I really, really, really struggled when my daughter was doing her A-levels to afford textbooks. So please, 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 if there is any reason why you cannot access this textbook for financial reasons, please come to me very, very discreetly. You don't have to tell anybody else and I will make sure that you get a copy of this book. Um, one of my biggest passions in life is education and one of my biggest hates in life, my pet peeves, is the fact that not everybody can access education simply because of money um, and financial status. I will not let that happen to my students. So please, if there is any reason why you want to do the course and you think the textbook is too expensive, you let me know straight away and I will get it for you at the earliest convenience. It is readily available in all sorts of shops, WH Smith's, Waterstones, um, Amazon, etc. Um, it's really, really easily accessible, but I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough. If you can't afford this, please let me know. So here are your teachers for year 12 and it should, hopefully these teachers will take you right through to the year um, end of year 13. Uh, my name is Miss Peterson. Um, I am the subject leader. My office is B19. My classroom is B16. I'm a permanent fixture there, so you can always find me in one or the other. Um, we have six lessons per week and it is split 4-2, which means that you will always have four lessons with me and you will have two lessons with either Miss Bell or Mrs. Mitchell. We do have um, a fourth teacher, Mrs. Burke, um, but she is only teaching year 13 this year. She will join us back in year 12 next year, but for this year she's doing year 13. So those are your teachers. Um, we are here to help you. We are here to listen to you and you can talk to any of us about anything. But I am the subject leader. If you really have any big issues with the subject, please, I'm the person to come and see. So this is basically what you will be studying over the two years. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this particular slide because all this information is readily available on the AQA website. We do study with the AQA board. Um, it's available on their website. The spec is there and um, the information is here at a glance. But at this stage, you're not going to be able to take in everything that you're going to do over two years. So, you know, don't worry too much about ex the ins and outs of what's got to be produced over the two years for now. Just be looking at whether or not this is the kind of thing that's going to interest you. As you can see, we look at language and the individual and how that individual sits, um, sits in society. Uh, we look at language diversity and change. We look at the ways in which different people use different language and how our language has changed over a period of time. Um, and the last thing that we do is what we call language in action. That is in year um, 13. We actually begin the research at the end of year 12, but that's year 13. And that is your independent study. That is when you are in a position to choose any element of the English language that interests you and come up with a, a, a sort of scientific examination um, and analysis of that use of language. So clearly we have expectations of the students who um, come on to our course. Um, it is a tough course, I won't, I won't kid you. Um, and it's only tough in that there's a lot of new stuff to be learned. The rest of it is kind of, you know, once you've got your head around the new stuff, the rest of it is really interesting. I know I'm biased, I keep saying that, but it is a very innovative subject and it is constantly, constantly changing. One of my reasons for loving this subject is that I can go in 
one day and learn something completely new the next. I can teach something one day and then say, hang on, I can add to this. One of the other things that I love about this is that my students teach me about language every day because you use language differently from the way that I use it. And I get as much from you in terms of what I learn as you do from me. Um, so we expect you to work hard and be proactive in your education. That means you just take control of your own study. Um, we hope that you will become an independent learner and a critical thinker, that you won't just sit there passively and accept everything that you will challenge. Obviously, we expect you to be polite and um, respectful to your teachers, but also I'm very, very hot on uh, being respectful to co-students at all times. We expect you to meet deadlines and just be punctual and attend regularly. It isn't that hard. Um, those are the easy bits. Along with my expectations, I have great hopes. Um, I have taught this subject for a number of years and every year I have been absolutely delighted in the level of inquiry that my students come up with. I have been delighted with the um, young people that I have taught and the young people that they have become as they've left the school. Um, so what I hope most of all is that you will enjoy the course and that you will develop your own ideas and challenge what we call conventional wisdoms. Those things that have been thrown at you that you've maybe thought, I don't get why we're made to do this. I don't get why we have to speak like this. I don't get why we have to think like this. This is the forum for all of that. We challenge everything in relation to language. Um, and I really hope that studying English language at Bulleswood will prove to be an asset to you, that whatever you decide to do in the future, whether you decide to go to university, whether you take an apprenticeship, whatever you decide to do in your life, I hope that English language is applicable. Well, you're clearly going to have expectations too. Um, you're going to want to know what we're going to teach you, how we're going to teach you and what you're going to get out of it. So in a nutshell, this is what I'm hoping that you will be able to get out of it. There are lots of other things, of course, but this is the academic side. Um, I hope that you will be able to examine and um, critically and analytically the following things. So the way that we um, use purpose, audience and context and how that impacts on the way that we use language and the way that we receive language, that you'll be able to do this by using linguistic concepts as analytical tools. You've got a list there. Don't worry if you don't understand any of those words at the moment. That's what I'm here to teach you. I'm hoping you're going to be bring all those things to bringing all those things together and looking at concepts of register, mode, idiolect, dialect and sociolect. And you're going to be able to do that by exploring, categorizing and grouping spoken and written language texts together and looking at the impact in a social, cultural, political, ideological context. I know it all sounds as though it's really out there at the, at the moment. It all sounds like it's um, space travel or something really, really highly academic like that. It is an academic subject, but you will be able to do this if you just trust us as teachers and let us guide you. However, it is really important that you recognize that English language is what we call a discursive subject. By very definition, it's language. We study spoken language a lot. So you will be encouraged to speak up and be heard. We will listen to everything that you say. In English language, you are encouraged to have an opinion. You are not encouraged to be passive absorbers of information which you regurgitate in an essay form. You are going to be encouraged to challenge, challenge, challenge. Um, it, as I said, it's a constantly involving subject. It's discursive. You'll be asked to think for yourself and to share those thoughts with your teachers and peers. The most successful um, English language students that we've had to date have not always been the students who've come to me with A stars in all their GCSEs, but they have been the students who have been, irrespective of their grades, inquisitive, independent, introspective and innovative. And if you're struggling with any of those words at the moment, your first little homework task is just to look them up in a dictionary. And here's a little tip. Be prepared to challenge everything you think you know about the language you use. So this is not a creative writing course. There's a little bit of scope to do a little bit of original writing in the coursework and the examination, but it's not much. It's not about learning how to write and to say things correctly. I will argue that there is no such thing as doing things correctly. It's very different from English language at GCSE level, but it will build on the skills that you learn. It is predominantly linguistics 
and the analysis and application of language in real contexts. It is an analytical discipline. It requires independent work and, as I said, critical thinking. Here's a little taster. OK, so this is a taster of the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at. Now, here I'm looking at the spoken word, but we look at the written word in equal measure. Um, we don't just look at the spoken word, but this because this is just such a brief introduction, I thought I'd just tell you what we do for the spoken word, because that's the way that we're going to communicate. That's the way that we communicate mostly in our lives. Our written communication is, is quite low level, except in the modern day, we are writing and writing and writing and writing more because most of us text go onto social media more than we actually speak beyond um, face to face conversations. So we're going to be looking at this. So we look about how how language conditions human relationships. How do we negotiate other human beings individually in large groups globally? How are we perceived by others? How do they perceive us because of the language that we choose? How do we perceive them? Have you got any prejudices about the way that people use language? And importantly, how does our use of language shape our individual and our collective identities? Obviously, um, we're going to be looking at the words and the, the grammar, et cetera, et cetera, that people use. But we're also going to be looking at other things that, that give us maybe some identity. So we're thinking paralinguistics. Para means alongside. So when you have things like parasol, it means alongside the sun and um, things like that. Um, Paralympics means alongside, alongside the standard Olympics. So we're going to be looking at what we call paralinguistics, i.e. the things, the language, the forms of language that go alongside the spoken word and prosodics, which are um, I will explain to you in a minute. But um, the following all come um, within the um, title under the subtitle of paralinguistics. So the tone of voice that you use, the pace, the volume, the intonation, the stress, the rhythm and the pitch. They are all what we call prosodics, but they come under the banner of paralinguistics. And also within that, body language, facial expression, all of these things, when we put them together with the words that we use and the way in which we structure the words, the way in which we structure those conversations, the way in which we, we, we use grammar, and they all come together to create an identity and to create an identity in a lot of different contexts. Think about how you use language differently in the classroom from how you use language when maybe you go to work or maybe when you speak to your friends or maybe when you speak to your grandparents, you have a different use of language in each of those contexts. And in each of those contexts, all of these will change alongside the words that you use, too. But what else goes alongside that to um, create our identity? So we'll be considering accents and dialects, the way that people say things and the things that they say. So accent is the way that you pronounce. Dialect is the lexis or the words and the grammatical structures that you might use. So think about which accents have more prestige. What do we mean when we say things like, oh, nicely spoken or talks um, properly? What does that actually mean? Why do we give some forms of language more value than others which have less prestige? Um, is someone's language part of her or his personality? Is the connection between pronunciation and status an arbitrary one? Is it something that's just decided on? It's um, just decided on in context. Is it real? Is there a real um, difference in levels of prestige or is it just something that society makes up? Is it possible to speak any dialect in any accent? So, for example, do you would you be able to speak um, a Geordie dialect with a Liverpool accent? How does that work? What reactions do we give to people with different regional accents from our own? The number of students who say to me, but I have no accent, miss. Everybody has an accent. You cannot speak without an accent. But what what kind of reactions do we have to somebody who's from Somerset or is a, is a Liverpudlian or Cockney or from Birmingham, Ulster, Yorkshire? Do you even know how many accents and dialects there are out there? Be thinking about those. And here is one of the biggest arguments in linguistics and in education. Should we teach children in schools to use more standardised accents? Think about that one, too. That's a really important, very important um, argument. So what else goes alongside the use of language to give us some identity? Well, think about status. We've also just mentioned prestige, but think about the status of a person. Um, 
you know, if you look at your different social groups, if you look, as I said, at your grandparents, if you look at your teachers, if you look at your peer groups, if you look at your um, friends at work, um, you know, people you know for um, other regions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what is the status of these people, and how does that affect the affect the way in which they present themselves? So, how does it affect the way in which you perceive them, or others perceive them, and they perceive you? Think about things, how you perceive how somebody older than you speaks. And when I'm thinking about age, um, I tend to get into this discussion with my students about what's older and what's younger. Think about sort of, you know, generations of people who are in their 80s, generations who are in their 60s, in their 40s, in their 20s. How do you perceive those different age groups? What about gender? Gender is a hugely changing area of language at the moment. It's incredible how quickly terminology around gender has changed and how we perceive gender. And the language has gone alongside that. We look at what we call hierarchical position or, or distance. And we're not talking about distance in sense of the physical sense that we have to do at the moment, the social distancing. And um, we're talking about distancing in a hierarchy. So um, how do we perceive somebody who's a judge or somebody who's a doctor or somebody who is a teacher or somebody who is a small child? Look at occupation, language and occupation. What about when somebody has a lot of knowledge or has a high education? How do we perceive their language? Look at the issues around race and language. We look a lot at multicultural languages. We look at African-American vernacular English, and we'll also look at multicultural London English. We will look at multicultural English across the UK, and we will be looking at the rise of estuary English and how those things have come together. Um, what about the language of class? The more um, deeply entrenched you are in the working class, the more likely you are to use a, a more regional dialect. Um, and sexuality, sexuality and gender, we tend to teach together, but we perceive them in two different ways. So there are all sorts of things that actually impact on the way that we use language and the way that our language is perceived. Now, I've talked a lot about language and identity so far. I've kept mentioning it and I've mentioned culture. And I just want you to look at this um, extract that is taken from a textbook. Um, and it says culture is a way of life. It's the context within which we exist, think, feel and relate to others. It's the glue that binds a group of people together. Culture is a blueprint that guides the behavior of people in a community, is incubated in family life, governs our behavior in groups and helps us know what others expect of us and the consequences of not living off to those expectations. Now, that's a very academic way of defining culture. It's a really interesting, it's a sociological way of defining culture. But as an English language student, once you get into it and you, you get your head around looking at texts and not just reading them, but analysing them, you will notice a couple of things in there. So you will notice, first of all, that despite the fact that it's a beautiful explanation of culture, Behaviour is spelt B-E-H-A-V-I-O-R, which will suggest that this is an American writer because of the spelling or what we call the orthography. It's an American writer or somebody who speaks Amer or uses and writes American English. You will also notice that the last couple of lines, the consequences of not living off to those expectations, you will recognise that that should be up to the ex those expectations. And you would have to decide if you were analysing this, whether you thought this was a basic bog standard typo, a typing error, or whether you thought that this was a dialectical way of using the language. Now, quite clearly, it's so obvious in this context, because it's an academic piece of writing, that it's a typo. But that's what you will immediately see, as well as thinking, ah, Miss has given us something to absorb and to think about what's actually being said and what the meaning behind that is. But you will jump on those things and you will see Ah, behaviour. That suggests that this person's culture is American. OK. Now, this slide is called cultural parameters, and that's just basically so these are the things that we look at within culture to measure how much an individual or a group um, are defined by their cultural use of language and how much um, that how much that I relates to their identity, how we perceive them, how they perceive others. So here's a just a little taster. Please don't worry too much if this sounds that it's going to be something that's too difficult because I'm introducing to something that you haven't even thought about yet, never mind studied. So we look at individualism um, and we look at the way in which a culture maybe values the needs of the self, the individual over the group, and whether within specific cultures, um, 
it doesn't have to be racial cultures it doesn't have to be ethnic cultures a culture can be a school culture so we will have a Buller's Wood school culture and in English language we will have an English language culture but it's about how the needs of the individual or the self is valued over the group so when we talk about um, somebody using a specific form of language I don't know maybe if we have a group of people who all use a very sort of standard English very um, received pronunciation what we tend to call posh and we will discuss that word at some point as well um, if somebody comes in and starts to speak in a um, I don't know Cockney accent in a Liverpudlian accent whatever and uses a dialect which does not conform um, is that okay is that going to be okay or does does a person have to conform to the needs of the group and um, power distance is what we've just spoken about that would be um, the extent to which we have equality versus inequality in power among members of the group again this is not talking about levels of poverty necessarily although we will talk about that as well but imagine you're in a group and there's like a um, like a little pecking order like a little power structure how does that work uncertainty and avoidance what about when people are in a situation where they feel uncomfortable it's not your comfort zone it's it's unstructured or it's unclear or it's unpredictable you don't know how to behave I remember being your age and coming from a very um, poor working class background um, I was absolutely out of my depth when people really spoke in a you know a received pronunciation or what I would have called posh in those days I was out of my depth and it really really made me feel um, insignificant and unintelligent when now I realize that the language is nothing to do with that at all um, gender role differentiation same kind of thing but in a, a gender construct um, action focus um, what about the differences in, in value and how people value doing things as a, as a, a you know as opposed to being how is the language of doing as opposed to being um, space and distance what about that um, that's a biggie at the moment because we are you know socially distancing and we can't get so close to people what what are the different standards for touching um, you know all those kind of things being close proxemics how close you stand um, eye contact and, and how we value privacy and um, that, 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 you know all those kind of things that we say that's you know that that, that makes me feel uncomfortable um, time orientation um, so maybe looking at um, how whether cultures get fixed in their perception of um, of how language should you know whether language should stay the same or whether it's going to be open to the fluidity of time and the last one is tightness and that is the degree to which a culture is homogenous i.e. how varied is that culture how tight is that culture how similar are the people within that culture and um, one of my favorite topics is the way in obviously the way in which we perceive others and the way in which people condemn others for their use of language that they sneer at others that they put the others down that you say you're not saying things correctly that you telling you to talk properly and one of the issues that I've encountered over particularly over the last 20 years um, also which has escalated over the last 10 years is the way in which there seems to be this this great hatred by certain generations of the way in which younger people might be using texting I text all the time um, and I'm well into my 60s so it's about thinking about how people perceive texting and sort of saying oh my goodness texting is killing the language it's creeping into the way that young people write underestimating the fact that young people can text in lots of abbreviations and slang one minute and write the most beautiful academic essay in the next breath so I would like you to watch um, this John McWhorter TED talk John McWhorter is an American linguist he's one of my favorite linguists he, he tells it much better than I do it's an amusing it's an amusing TED talk but it might give you some idea of how we're going to be looking at the uh, how young people use language and um, if you this link doesn't work it has worked thus far but if it doesn't work just um, Google John McWhorter TED talk texting is killing language Well, I hope I haven't bored you over the last couple of slides and that you, you know, given you some sort of interest into English language. It's such a small taster. There is so much more. It's a real drop in the ocean, tip of the iceberg kind of an introduction. Um, 
But I thought I'd try to focus on the kind of things that, that interest me and I would hope interest you because you are the people who are changing language right now. The language that you use, the choices that you make in your language are the ones that are going to feed into the next generation. My generation's language is, you know, you're going to be taking on board some of it, but my language is going to be floating off into the ether somewhere when I do. So I hope you, um, you know, I hope you're going to be interested and I hope you can see some element of it that is going to excite you. Um, and what should you do now? Well, I would suggest that you make this summer break as productive as possible. We've been a long time out of school because of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, so, so don't feel as though I'm going to be asking you to do any academic essays or do any great depth of study. But I think it would be a really good idea if you just have a little read around, if you do a bit of a Google, if you have a look at um, some of the stuff that's out there, have a look at the, um, you know, AQA um, spec and see what's out there but try to make the summer productive try to get your head around thinking for me thinking is one of the most underestimated things that we do in academic um, education very often I will say to my students just put your pens down don't touch anything and just think about this for a couple of minutes so try and spend the summer having a good old think maybe you could start to collect your scrapbook and um, i do suggest that all english language students collect a scrapbook um, just a cheap old thing from the pound shops that you just cut and paste and um, literally cut and paste as it with scissors and glue um, and stick things into your scrapbook so that you start to collect a range of different forms of text you can listen to somebody's conversation on a train and transcribe it that's absolutely fine and then stick it in the scrapbook on the next slide i'm going to give you some more ideas but this is something that if you continue to collect these scrapbooks as you go through English language in both years to, um, 12 and year 13, you can just stick um, any text in at all. As you learn each element of English language, you can annotate these texts and then you can keep going back and keep going back as you learn more and more. By the end of year 13, you should have a couple of books of text that you have put together that you can use for practice um, exam texts. You can use them for revision. Um, but it will be your own personal collection of what we call corpus linguistics. As I said, you can collect anything at all to put in these in these um, scrapbooks. As wide a variety of text as possible. Don't throw anything away. A bus ticket, a train ticket. Um, I'm saying bus ticket and train ticket, and I'm really aware that hardly anybody's travelling on those. But transcribe any conversations that you hear. What, what kind of conversations do you have when you go into your local shop? Um, have you gone from saying, good morning, how are you, to, oh yeah, you know, lockdown's um, eased up a bit. Have you, has, your, has COVID started to sort of creep into your everyday conversations where it just used to be, hi, how are you doing? Um, annotate them in detail if you can. If you can't, as your knowledge and understanding grow, you can re-annotate, you can annotate. It isn't a big deal. Um, start to make links between your texts. Just read, read, read. Um, a great kind of mistake to make about English language is that we don't have as much reading as English literature. In English literature, you will have set books to read and it's an awful lot of, you know, in terms of volume. But in terms of variety of text, you probably read more in English language than you do in English literature. So just start anything. Um, it doesn't have to be academic. It can be absolutely anything back of the cereal box in the morning. A few examples for you, um, newspaper, magazine articles, ads, transcripts, scripts, bus tickets, official letters, those leaflets that come through the door, instruction manuals, um, school notices, any of the um, emails that you've had recently, photographs of billboards. If you're walking past and you see these billboards or big signs up or on the sides of buses, take a photograph, flyers, food labels, handwritten notes, post-its, brochures, the list is endless, absolutely endless. As I said, the back of a cereal box, absolutely anything can be cut out or photographed or downloaded and stuck into your scrapbook. Then of course, there is your summer project. Um, the summer project isn't as difficult as it, it looks. Um, just have a look at it and just kind of fill in what you can. But it's there on the VLE. It's a booklet and it outlines a mini project that we'll expect you to have completed for your first lesson in September, or at least your first week. Complete it to the best of your ability and be prepared to talk to me about it at length in the class um, with the rest of the class. And we'll have lots of questions. It's not a big formal 
um, Q&A session. It's a sitting around talking about how we feel about language. And when I say complete it to the best of your ability, I'm expecting most people to do it differently. Um, and that is the joy and that is the experiment that we're, we're hoping to conduct is how differently we interpret things and how differently we actually put things together, how we perceive them and how we present language. So don't be worried about, oh, my goodness, does she, how does she want me to do it? What's right and what's wrong? Just have a go. It's not going to be marked. It's going to be a basis for discussion when we come in. And if you get it done, then you are going to enjoy your first lesson because you are going to be able to contribute at whatever level you choose. Um, if you're an external student who's joining Bullerswood for um, the first time, you may find it a little bit problematic if you don't know how to negotiate our VLE. Um, if you do have any problems, please email me and I will email you a copy back as quickly as possible. Um, but that goes to all, for all students. So if you are a Bullerswood student um, and you're having problems accessing the work, you know where to find me and I will send you a copy of the work um, by email. Um, Obviously, we're not going to be able to give hard copies out at the moment, but on the next slide, um, I haven't narrated it, but on the next slide, it's showing you how to access the VLE. If you can't um, get hold of me for some reason, which is, is very unlikely, but if you can't, then please contact the sixth form team and they should be able to help you. So finally, um, have a good summer. I hope that you are able to get out and about a little bit more than we have of recent months and that you're able to see your friends again. Um, but I do hope that you will be able to do a little bit of reading to get your head around what you need to do in September and, and to get yourselves in that, that mindset where you're thinking about learning and you're thinking about how exciting it's going to be to move on to the next stage of your academic career and the next stage of your adult life. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you in September. I'm really looking forward to teaching a new cohort. Um, so I'll see you then. Bye for now.